Yeah. Okay. I feel like I lost my voice. So this is gonna be fun. So today I'm gonna talk about The Gracier by Kim Lidget, which is a fantastic young adult book, which I have over here. Over here. This is a great book. And today I'm gonna talk about exposition in the first chapter of this book. This is a young adult dystopian book about a society in which all 16 year old girls go on something that's called the grace year. It's like the Handmaid's Tale meets the Hunger Games. All women are believed to have some power or some kind of, of magical abilities that they come into when they're 16. And they are all in the society sent to this like place to go on their grace year. They like leave the society for a year and many of them don't come back and nobody talks about what happens during the grace year. And clearly it's violent because people whisper about it and there are a bunch of rumors and people are like missing parts of their fingers and all sorts of weird creepy stuff. And a lot of girls die during the grace year. So this is a story about a 16 year old girl named Tierney who goes on her grace year when she is 16. And it's like about the mystery of the grace year and what happens and all of the creepy, creepy stuff that happens when girls are pitted against each other in a kind of Lord of the Flies type situation. I loved reading this book. I thought it was really, really well done. And so today I'm going to talk about the first section of The Grace Year and dissect exactly how Kim Lidget was able to establish the world and incorporate all the world building without it being super obvious and exposition-y. So I'm gonna go really in detail in the first section of this book and dissect it like paragraph by paragraph, line by line to show you what exposition looks like and world building setup looks like when it's done really well. The first section of this book is heavily reliant on clues and drops details that don't tell readers too much, but tell them just enough to hook them into the story and want make them want to know more about the story. And I think that there is a lot that we writers can learn from it. So we're learning today. But before we get started, hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Claire Fraze and I am an award-winning young adult author who makes videos on this channel sharing the actionable writing tips that helped me make my own writing better. I'm the author of young adult supernatural thriller, They Stay, which is the first in a series and tells the story of a 16 year old girl whose younger brother goes missing. And as she goes and is searching for him, a girl in her class approaches her and tells her that a ghost in their town cemetery knows where her younger brother is. So she has to decide whether she's going to believe the classmate and believe in ghosts, or she doesn't believe the classmate and doesn't believe in ghosts. And what ensues is a creepy supernatural adventure, kind of Stranger things s and I'm not just saying that because Stranger Things season four just came out and Stranger Things is a hot button topic right now. I was comparing it to Stranger Things long before season four came out. <laughs> I'm also the author of They Whisper, which is the second book in that series and it exists and I'm very proud of it. So I have my computer on my lap because I have a lot to say about this and I've written basically an entire essay that I'm going to talk through with you. So the book starts with a page that is basically about the grace year. It doesn't tell you anything about the society that they live in, only about the hook of the book, which is that the grace year is forbidden and nobody talks about it and it's kind of scary. And also, you know, what the book shares its title with, the grace year. So I'm gonna read to you the first couple of sentences of the book just so you get a feel for it. No one speaks of the grace year, it's forbidden. We're told we have the power to lure grown men from their beds, make boys lose their minds and drive the wives mad with jealousy. They believe our very skin emits a powerful aphrodisiac, the potent essence of youth, of a girl on the edge of womanhood. That's why we're banished for our 16th year, to release our magic into the wild before we're allowed to return to civilization. But I don't feel powerful. I don't feel magical. Speaking of the grace year is forbidden, but it hasn't stopped me from searching for clues. This doesn't tell you anything about what the grace year is. This doesn't tell you anything about what the society looks like. It only tells you that obviously there is a marking that this is not our world because it says, you know, they believe our very skin emits a powerful aphrodisiac. That, I mean, it's, it's not really something that is in the modern world. So immediately from reading this, you get the sense 
that this is a different genre, not like a contemporary book, that this is a world that is going to be built. This immediately hooks the reader, but it doesn't tell them too much. It's not an info dump because it's just like a tiny piece of information, this whole, that's why we're banished for our 16th year to release our magic into the world before we're allowed to return to civilization. It's not dumping all the information on you. It's not saying, you know, we are banished for our 16th year because we need to release our magic into the wild because of this, because of this, because this is how society is structured and it's a big dump. Like it's, it's just kind of a little subtle clue and then they move on to, but I don't feel powerful, I don't feel magical. So it's just dropping it in there, but it's not explaining it at length. So it's not an info dump, it's just a clue. So it goes on to, you know, continue this page all about like, you know, secrets whispered about the Gracier, building up the mystery. And in the in this first page, in this first section, Kim Lidget drops a couple of hints as to what the world is going to be like without telling readers anything about what the world is gonna be like. So she uses phrases like lovers in the meadow or women at the market or the slip of a shawl and under a harvest moon. Like these phrases don't tell you anything specific about the world building, but they do hint that it's not a contemporary world, that there's something different about this world, whether it's maybe a little bit of historical fiction or magical realism kind of interpretation of a historical society. Just the way that it's written and using phrases like that signal to the reader that this is not a contemporary book. I really like this because it's not too on the nose. It's not telling you anything about the society or making anything super clear about the world building. It's, it's all, it's, it's hints. These are hints that are in the language. So one thing that, you know, we as writers need to keep in mind while we're writing is that there's a lot that we can do with just the way that these opening sections are written to signal to readers what kind of book it's gonna be. Okay, so. Turning this page and moving on to chapter one, part one, autumn. This is like the way that the books are divided into parts because it's all about one year. So they don't have any chapters, they just have parts. Okay, so the first paragraph I'm gonna read to you. I follow her through the woods, a well-worn path I've seen a thousand times. Ferns, lady slipper and thistle, the mysterious red flowers dotting the path. Five petals, perfectly formed, like they were made just for us. One petal for the Gracier girls, one petal for the wives, one for the laborers, one for the women of the outskirts, and one for her. So the beginning of this paragraph doesn't give you that much, but this last sentence has lots of clues about the world building of this world. Like it shows that this is definitely not a historical society or a modern society. This is like a new fantasy-esque society that is going to require some world building. So like in this society, it says in the sentence, there are multiple categories of women. You have the Gracier girls, you have the wives, you have the laborers, you have the women of the outskirts and then her, but her is not necessarily a category of woman, it's just the girl in Tierney's dreams. But this is a really effective clue because immediately just in the language and in the categories that these women are grouped into, you can immediately tell that this is an extremely patriarchal society. The fact that, you know, if a woman is not a gracier girl, then she's a wife. And then if she's not a wife, she's a laborer. And if she's not a laborer, she's in the outskirts. Like those are the only things women can be in this society. So we know it's not, necessarily contemporary. Also note that Lidget doesn't explain any of this in this paragraph. Like the chapter continues in talking about the dream that Tierney is having. It doesn't launch into a big explanation of what the laborers are, what the outskirts are, let alone what the gracier is. She just puts it in the narrative and moves on as if we are supposed to understand what all of these things are. And it's only the first paragraph of the book. So obviously we don't. But even just putting it in there, like, you know, we might not know what a gracier girl is or a woman of the outskirts is, but we have an idea of what a wife is and what a laborer is. And because, you know, we as readers are smart, we can start to put together what the society might look like, even though there are still some blank spots. I mean, there are a lot of blank spots. Like we don't know what the outskirts are, but we have an idea of the kind of society that might send women to the outskirts. This allows us to start building a picture of what the society is going to be like without us having anything explained to us. So in this section, Tierney, who's the main character, is having a dream and using this dream, 
Kim Lidget, is able to further paint the picture of a society without being bound to the events that need to take place in chapter one. So for example, on the second page, we get details like, or lines of dialogue that say, we are the weaker sex, weaker no more, the girl says. The women answer with a primal roar. Or also, this path has been paved with blood, the blood of our own, but it was not in vain. Tonight, the grace year comes to an end. These are not things that happen in the actual events in the real world in the first chapter, but this dream and the idea that, you know, these women have gathered in this clearing and, you know, nobody is jealous or murdering each other and everyone comes together in unity and saying we are the weaker sex, weaker no more, that further solidifies this idea of the patriarchal society and this idea of women rebelling kind of in silence under the radar in this scary patriarchal society. Really, as soon as the book says the words weaker sex, we get an idea of what kind of society it is. And we also get a sense for the way that the grace year has affected all of the women in the society. And this whole theme of the grace year being scary is solidified in these early pages. The overwhelming theme of this book is the whole, the weaker sex are not so weak and that gets set up very, very early on in this chapter through the dream. So the dream is an effective method to world build because you can drop in some events that might not reasonably happen in reality in your first chapter. So then Tierney wakes up from her dream and then now is where we get to all of the fun expositiony bits because this is the real world, real life in her society. Usually it's given as writing advice that you don't want to have your character waking up from a dream as the first thing that happens in your book, but I honestly think it works here. Especially because we get this gem of a sentence right after Tierney wakes up from her dream saying, we're not allowed to dream. The men believe it's a way we can hide our magic. Having the dreams would be enough to get me punished, but if anyone ever found out what the dreams were about, it would mean the gallows. So in the book, it's explained that when Tierney was asleep, her sisters heard her mumbling, as if indicating that she was dreaming, but after she woke up, her oldest sister kind of diverted attention away from the fact that she had been dreaming. And then Tierney says that they're not allowed to dream, which adds another hint to the type of world that it will be. And by now I feel like everybody's getting a pretty decent idea of what kind of society this is. Because, and you know, there are a lot of blanks still there, but we're gonna fill in the blanks as we get further in the chapter. But already the structure is there. Just by these brief clues, by page seven, we as readers already know that it's first, a patriarchal society, second, that women are extremely oppressed in this society, and third, that the gracier is very dangerous. That's kind of the main three parts of this world. All the rest is just details. So now we get this flutter of Tierney getting ready and dressed and everything, and then Tierney's mother comes in and says, stop your fussing, my mother says, taking out her frustration on my scalp as she finishes my braid. Your father has let you get away with murder all these years with your mud-stained frocks, dirt under your nails. For once you're going to know what it feels like to be a lady. Why bother Ivy flaunts her growing belly in the looking glass for all of us to see? No one in their right mind would give a veil to tyranny. So be it, my mother says, as she grabs the corset strings and pulls them even tighter, but she owes me this. I was a willful child, too curious for my own good, head in the clouds, lacking propriety, among other things, and I will be the first girl in our family to go into her grace year without receiving a veil. My mother doesn't need to say it. Every time she looks at me, I feel her resentment, her quiet rage. So here we get our first instance of telling in these opening pages. Tierney saying like, I was a willful child, too curious for my own good, and every time she looks at me, I feel her resentment are both instances of telling, but they're very brief. They're only one sentence, and I think that they work really well to paint this picture of Tierney's relationship with her family. I've said it before and I'll say it again, telling is okay. Showing is not the only thing that you do. If you only showed everything, your book would be really boring. Sometimes you need to say one or two little things of telling to help paint a picture of something or color something, especially when you are trying to world build. Don't tell too much, but also you can tell and it's okay. Also, this section drops some hints at this whole veiling ceremony thing, which is not mentioned before this section of the chapter. It drop some hints as to what it could be and also its relationship to the grace year ceremony. So note that also Kim Lidget doesn't say like, 
doesn't follow up what Ivy said about, you know, tyranny not getting a veil by saying the veiling ceremony is a blah, 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 blah. Like she, she doesn't explain it. She just mentions it and moves on. And honestly, she doesn't need to say the veiling ceremony is a ceremony in which blah, 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 because she can rely on the fact that a veil represents a certain thing in our society that readers will probably pick up on. They'll also be able to probably put it together with Ivy's pregnant belly and figure, or at least give them a pretty good idea of what the veiling ceremony would be. But it also leaves enough curiosity that we're excited about it. Like we have an idea that it'll probably have something to do with marriage, but we don't know how it works and we don't know what like receiving a veil means in detail. Like you probably have an idea, okay, I guess the boys in this society would give veils to the girls if it's like a veiling ceremony, but you don't know any of the details. So it leaves enough open that readers will be curious and want to keep reading. Oh, I added a little paragraph thing that I wrote about showing and not telling in this essay that I wrote. <clears throat> A common piece of advice is to never tell and always show in world building, but I disagree with this. I like to think that show don't tell means never tell lazily and always show deliberately. Don't tell people things that could be shown and don't drone on too long because it will get boring. Show things that will create intrigue, add color, or mm. answer questions about the world. Okay, but cool. So we're reading, we're reading, we turn the page. And then we get a paragraph of telling about the veiling ceremony. There are 12 eligible boys in Garner County this year, boys born into families that have standing and position, and there are 33 girls. Today, we're expected to parade around town, giving the boys one last viewing before they join the men in the main barn to trade and barter our fates like cattle, which isn't for that far off considering we're branded at birth on the bottom of our foot with our father's sigil. When all the claims have been made, our fathers will deliver the veils to the awaiting girls at the church, silently placing the gauzy monstrosities on the chosen one's heads. And tomorrow morning, when we're all lined up in the square to leave for our grace year, each boy will lift the veil of the girl of his choosing as a promise of marriage, while the rest of us will be completely dispensable. So wow, it's a paragraph of telling. Aren't all paragraphs of telling and exposition terrible? Not this one. There are a couple of reasons why I believe this paragraph works so well. First of all, it's really short. It does not take that long to read. It's not like Kim Lidget is droning on for a really long time explaining everything. And you kind of do need to explain some things in world building. And what makes it work is that it isn't, it doesn't read like she's droning on about anything. The prose is really engaging and it's very grounded in Tierney's opinion on the entire thing. So for example, you know, she talks with such disdain when she even describes things like silently placing the gauzy monstrosities on the chosen one's heads. You, that makes it pretty clear what Tierney thinks about this whole situation. And so it's really engaging because it not only shows something about the world, but it also further develops Tierney's character. We still have no idea what the grace year is, but we do learn what the veiling ceremony is, and learning about what the veiling ceremony is helps flesh out the world even more, because if this world is capable of branding girls on the bottoms of the feet with their father's sigil and doing this kind of ceremony and treating marriage in this way, you know, it opens the mind to what other scary stuff they could do to girls if this is how they treat their women. It's creepy stuff. So now we get some fighting with the mom about how being a wife is awesome and how Tierney would rather be anything else. And then we get another clue about the world. This little lovely gem of a sentence reads, the poachers would love to get their hands on you. Poachers? I didn't learn about poachers yet. This is the first time that poachers are mentioned in this chapter. As like, when, the, when I read this for the first time, I had no idea what they were. But just the word poacher sounds so creepy and menacing that even though I don't know what poachers are or don't understand the context around it at all, I can't wait for that to be elaborated on because it's really, really creepy. <laughs> I'm noticing now as I'm filming this video that it seems to be a pattern that Kim Lidget will just drop something into dialogue as if readers are supposed to know about it. So, you know, like the veiling ceremony, Ivy mentions it and then the next page 
it is elaborated on more. Like, I, I'm pretty sure if my memory is serving me right, that poachers are also somewhat elaborated on, if not in the first chapter, maybe the second chapter. It's, it's followed up quickly. Like, she doesn't leave you guessing about things for too, too long. But the first time that they're introduced, they're introduced as if the reader should already know about it. So now a new character comes in, Tierney's father, and now we get to see firsthand the relationships that men and women have in this society. So Tierney has another short paragraph of telling, talking about her father and how they used to be close and how he taught her how to hunt and fish. But then she caught him having an affair and then she lost all respect for him. So this is all, this is super, I mean, I, this isn't super important world building stuff, but it reinforces the patriarchal society description. And also the paragraphs of telling are pretty short and they're in Tierney's voice, they're still engaging. So now we have a really great paragraph from Tierney, which isn't telling, it's explaining her reactions and her opinions on marriage. So she's not explaining marriage and what marriage is, but she's going on a mental rant about her opinion on marriage. And this is a really awesome tool because you can slip a lot of not only world building information, but also character information into paragraphs like this. I'll read it for you. I keep my mouth clamped shut, but inside I want to scream. Being married off isn't a privilege to me. There's no freedom and comfort. They're padded shackles to be sure, but shackles nonetheless. At least in the labor house, my life will still belong to me. My body will still belong to me. But those kinds of thoughts will get me in trouble, even when I don't say them out loud. When I was small, every thought showed on my face. I've learned to hide behind a pleasant smile, but sometimes when I catch my reflection in the glass, I see the intensity burning in my eyes. The closer I get to my gracier, the hotter the fire burns. Sometimes I feel like my eyes are going to sear right out of my skull. So you see how clever that is? You get all of that information about marriage and the gracier and the labor camps, not in an explanation by the author, but in a rant by Tierney. This makes the readers feel closer to her as a character. It reinforces how she feels about the society she lives in, which is important as she navigates the gracier. And at the same time, we get all of this information about, you know, how labor camps are now an alternative to marriage and how, Women, I guess if they don't get a veil, are sent to go work at labor camps. So then we get another traditional telling paragraph, but I think it's really well placed. We have a lot of world building in this scene that is tied into clothing, so like dresses and veils and especially hair. And this, as Tierney is getting dressed, the world building is elaborated on a little bit. So this is the section that ties into hair braiding. It doesn't really feel artificial, like it's artificially telling you what it is because it comes up naturally like when Tierney is doing her hair. All the women in Garner County have to wear their hair the same way, pulled back from the face, plaited down the back. In doing so, the men believe the women won't be able to hide anything from them. A snide expression, a wandering eye, or a flash of magic. White ribbons for the young girls, red for the grace here girls, and black for the wives. Innocence, blood, death. Not much to say on this one other than it's a cool idea that you can get away with telling if you bring it up in a natural place. So this is a re another really great exposition moment that comes up naturally without an escort. I don't need an escort, I say as I cram my sturdy feet into the fine black leather slippers. I can handle myself. And what of the fur trappers from the territory? Can you handle them as well? That was one girl and it was ages ago. I let out a sigh. I remember it like it was yesterday. Anna Berglund, my mother says, her eyes glazing over. It was our veiling day. She was walking through the town and he just snatched her up, flung her over his horse and took off into the wilderness, never to be heard from again. It's odd. What I remember most about that story is that even though she was seen screaming and crying all through town, the men declared she didn't fight hard enough and punished her younger sister in her stead by casting her to the outskirts for a life of prostitution. That's the part of the story no one ever speaks of. So this story and little moment comes up naturally because the information is offered as a result of Tierney asking to go out. It's dropped in at the perfect place and it adds an extra dimension to the world and also kind of goes back to that mention of the poachers from earlier without feeling like the author is artificially trying to shove that information into the chapter. One great way to think about world building, I think, is thinking about readers as members of your world. 
don't try to explain everything to them, but occasionally jog their memory. Like maybe they're forgetful members of your world. You don't wanna sound like you're talking down to your reader because that's going to alienate them really quick, but you also don't wanna treat them so familiar, familiarly, with such familiarity that you thrust them into the middle of a battle scene without explaining anything right off the bat and have them be super confused. So it's like a dance in between those two things. So then you have another great moment which adds another character and immediately colors a relationship that we are going to be expecting to see in this book. So, I suppose it'll be all right as long as Tyranny's not planning on skulking off into the woods to meet Michael Welk. I try to play it off, but my throat goes bone dry. I had no idea she knew about that. She tugs down on the bodice of my dress, trying to get it to sit right. Tomorrow, when he lifts Kirsten Jen Jenkins's veil, you're going to realize how foolish you've been. That's not what, that's not why we're just friends, I sputter. Tierney does not offer this information about Michael Welks on her own. This is critical because it doesn't make the readers feel like Tierney is talking down to them and explaining everything. The mom is just naturally bringing him up in conversation and immediately without her saying, Michael Welk has been my best friend since I was five. She obviously has some kind of connection to him. He's obviously important to her. And that is shown in the way that she reacts by like sputtering and being thrown off guard and her throat going bone dry and her being defensive. It's obviously an important person to her. And it's obviously bothering her that her mother is talking about him in this way. Then we get another really great sentence. As she takes off her thimble to fetch a coin from her deerskin pouch, I catch a glimpse of the missing tip of her thumb. She's never said as much, but I know it's a memento from her grace year. This is super subtle, but I love this line. Like not only does the sentence takes off her thimble to fetch a coin from her deerskin pouch, make this feel like it's not a contemporary world. Like it, it's, it, 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 is a, it feels like kind of a historical different world. But also the thumb is just a creepy detail. And for that to be connected with the grace here, it adds an extra sense of foreboding to the m mystery of the grace here and made me as a reader just want to know more about it. It caused a lot of simultaneous dread and desire and it was just such a great little detail. So at this point in the story, Tierney goes out and she goes on her walk and everything by herself. And as she's out on her walk, she encounters a girl from her year, Gertrude Fenton, passes with her mother. I can't help but look at her hands. They're covered in dainty white lace gloves. It almost makes me forget about what happened to her. Almost. Then this is never really brought up again until later. I wanted to include this because it's a clue and it's a great example of opening some questions in your opening chapter and leaving them unanswered. Readers continue reading. It's, this is what makes world building so frustrating. It's because you want to make sure that you open enough questions that your readers want to know more about the questions that you raise. But if there are too many answered questions, that is also a problem because then there is not gonna be something that is pulling them into the next chapters if everything is explained in an info dump right away. But this is really great because I wanna know what happened to Gertrude and I'm gonna keep reading until I find out what happened to Gertrude. I would say that you wanna to try to shoot for maybe opening up like one or two small mysteries like that in the first chapter of your book if you're writing a book like this that requires some world building, just because it's helpful to have a couple of little specific mysteries pulling readers into your next chapters. There's another really great example, and this is why it was such a good idea to have Tierney leave the house, is because you can see her interaction with the society that is not just her interactions with her own family. Happy veiling day, Mrs. Barton regards me as she clings to her husband's arm a little tighter. Who's that, Mr. Barton asks. The James girl, she replies through gritted teeth. The middle one. His gaze rakes over my skin. I see her magic has finally come in, or she's been hiding it. Her eyes narrow on me with the focus of a vulture pecking away at a carcass. So what do we get just from this short interaction? We get this idea of the male gaze and what this magic might actually represent in this story. 
we get the larger societal opinion of veiling day, that it's happy veiling day and like it's regarded as something that is nice from other people in the society, not this horrible, dreadful thing that Tierney has told us that it is. And we also get a glimpse at the animosity that is held between women in this society, which foreshadows the violence that will take place during the grace year. All of the women are pitted against each other in this horrible, twisted, creepy society that I would, I'm so glad I don't live in. And you can see that in Mrs. Barton's reaction to Tierney, like her eyes narrow on me with the focus of a vulture pecking away at a carcass. This is an older woman looking and talking about a teenager like this. None of this stuff was explicitly said. All of it was just put in this little interaction between these characters, just a couple of lines. And you get a lot about the world and Tierney's relationship with it from that moment. You also get stuff about the major themes of the book and kind of the connections and maybe commentary it could be making about our society. And then now I know you've all been waiting for this moment. We get the note on which the chapter ends. My chin begins to quiver when I think of the year ahead, the unknown, but I plaster on a vacant smile as if I'm happy to play my part so I might return and marry and breed and die. But not all of us will make it home, not in one piece. So we as readers still don't know what the grace year is. Tierney doesn't know what the grace year is, but ending it on that note, that not in one piece line, emphasizes this idea that Kim Lidget has been slowly feeding us, that the grace year is dangerous. This is the confirmation of the creepy feeling that we've been feeling because of all the little tiny clues and things that she's been alluding to in the first chapter. And now we already have a pretty clear idea of what this society is like. Obviously we don't, don't know everything. We still don't know what happened to Gertrude. We don't really have, we've, we haven't met Michael Welk. We haven't been or seen the Veiling Day or any of that stuff. They haven't embarked on their grace here yet. But this is a really good foundation because already I mean, I as a reader knew a lot of things about the world and could start coloring a picture of the world myself before getting into the second and third chapters. So I know I just threw a lot of stuff at you. So to wrap up and synthesize all of the stuff that we just talked about, there are five things that we can learn about the way that Kim Lidget built the world in the first chapter of The Grace Year that we can apply to our own writing when we are writing stories that require some world building. The first one is that you need to keep it natural. You want to choose something as the activity in the first chapter of your story that is meaningful to your world. Choose some kind of activity that allows you to naturally bring up different parts of your world that are going to be important later in the story. That's why this whole getting ready slash dream sequence was really good for this story because it allowed Tierney to have all those moments with her parents and with her sisters and because the hair and the outfits and everything signify so, or hold so much meaning in this world, she was able to convey that to readers in a very natural way because she was actually getting dressed and ready. The second thing that we can learn is that we need to keep our world building active. This is kind of goes hand in hand with the last keep it natural point, but you wanna make sure that your characters are doing something. You don't want them to just be sitting around explaining parts of the world. You want them to be interacting actively with the world so that they can kind of have commentary on different parts of the world that can color it and articulate it and tell it or show it to readers in some way. The more actively your character is participating in the world, the easier it is to convey the world to readers without having it feel like your character is just walking through the streets, just pointing at things and thinking about them. The third thing is that you don't wanna be authorial. Don't get on your pedestal and explain all of these different facets of your world. I don't care if you've spent 10 years coming up with the entire mythology for your world or created a hard magic system that is incredibly detailed and nuanced and amazing. You don't wanna stand up on your f pedestal in your first chapter of your book and explain every single little tiny spell in your magic system and how it works or every single little tiny history fact about your world. Your readers don't need to know every single war that happened in your fantasy world over the past 500 years in your first chapter, unless it is extremely relevant to what is happening in your first chapter. And keep it grounded in the voice of your main character. If you're writing a young adult book in the first person point of view of a teenager, you wanna make sure that they sound like an authentic teenager and you don't wanna sound like the author 
talking through a teenager to the readers about your world. You don't want them to sound like a teenager and all of a sudden you have three paragraphs that are very technical, maybe that and your character isn't super technical and it is a shift in tone and you're explaining everything about the world. You want to see the world through the character's eyes. So like how Tierney went on rants about marriage in different parts of the world, you got to see the world from her perspective through her eyes. Fourth, don't forget that your readers are smart. Don't talk down to them because they will be able to put things together. And finally, fifth, use short little clues to create intrigue and use language to color the type of world that it is. Pick certain words that characters might not say in a contemporary world if you're not writing a contemporary fiction story and use those in your narrative to signal to readers that this isn't a contemporary fiction story. The writing style can add a lot to your world building so you need to use language to help flesh out your world in this way. So if you haven't already read this book, I highly recommend that you pick it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, my name is Claire Fraze and I'm an award-winning young adult author who makes videos on this channel sharing the actionable writing tips that helps me make my own writing better. This was me dissecting The Grace Year by Kim Lidget. I also like to do deep dives into other popular young adult books when I feel that they do something particularly well because I am always learning and feel that there is a lot to learn from other authors who do things really well. Have you read The Grace Year? What did you think? Comment below your thoughts and also if you have a book that you feel explained everything and built its world really well in its opening chapters, let me know down in the description because I am always looking for extra books to read to study this kind of stuff and I think it's really important to read a lot because without reading a lot you can't really learn how to write. I hope you have a good week everyone and as always, happy writing!